study into my phone. So George Fiddler, uh, not his first time on the SMB MSP stage, creative director for Olson Engage, uh, and he always brings us really interesting stuff. So I'm anxious to hear this one. Uh, George entered the marketing industry just as social media was emerging as a useful tool for brands in 2008. I uh, started at Olson in 2012 as a leader in the agency's social media department. He's now creative director with a focus on social media PR and experiential creative. Outside of Olson, he volunteers for Brand Lab, serves as a judge for the Shorty Awards, and has completed a term as the marketing chair for the University of Minnesota's College of Liberal Arts Alumni Board. Please welcome George Fiddler to the stage. Okay, I think we're set up. Uh, good morning. It's uh, so nice to be here with everyone on this uh, balmy 14 degree April morning. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, and it's, it's really nice to be uh, kicking off social media breakfast today, uh, talking about um, an underrated breakfast food, ice cream. Uh, I think it's true, you know, they, uh, they actually make uh, bacon flavored ice cream. Uh, not they as in Blue Bunny, but you know, like they, in general, it exists, something to consider maybe for uh, future events. But uh, as Michael said, uh, my name's George Fiddler, creative director over at Olson Engage. We're a couple blocks away. Um, we are the uh, PR, social media, and experiential branch of ICF Olson. And, um, you know, I think we make a lot of, do a lot of great social media work from content to strategy, community management, promotions, you name it. But uh, one area that we take a lot of pride in is uh, what we call right time engagement. And that is our practice of monitoring for and identifying pop culture opportunities, whether that be reactive or proactive, that um, are right for our clients to, uh, in this case, hop on. And I, I tried to get the bunny to hop over to the word opportunities on click here, but it just couldn't get that PowerPoint uh, thing to work out. So maybe next time. But. Um, Sorry, just a second, clicker, there we go. So uh, on the reactive front, when I talk about reactive, obviously these are those pop culture moments that you can't plan for, right? That they come up every single day on our tweet deck columns, on you know, Facebook trending topics, on the, the homepage of Reddit, right? And um, you know, every day we're, we're looking for these moments and the majority of the time, while you know, they be, may be mildly amusing from you know, flowing mullets here on Reddit or, you know, a tweet about ice cream actually makes your body warmer because of its fat content. You know, fun fact, I don't know how legal would like that if uh, we were to retweet that, but uh, you know, the, the ma majority of the time, uh, it's amusing, but it's not something that we deem worthy of flagging for the client and sort of turning in uh, to a social media stunt, right? But when it does hit on that one out of 10 days, whatever it may be, um, it, it can be really worth it because the, the impact and the results that the, the reaction to that thing that we find uh, can be really uh, pretty amazing. Damn it. Sorry. I don't know why the clicker is being a little funny this morning. Um, Is Sarah here? She gave me this clicker. <laughs> um, can you go back one? Yeah. Yep. Back one again. Sorry. Okay. So on the uh, the proactive front, just like every day, we're monitoring for those reactive uh, moments. We're also looking ahead, right, in the the days, the the weeks, the months, the quarters to come. Like what's happening, right? So uh, those sort of Cheesy uh, awareness day calendars, right? Um, shout out to anyone in Nebraska, National Nebraska Day yesterday. Today is, uh, got someone in the house, Nebraska, nice. 
uh, National Caramel Popcorn Day today, right? Got uh, Vice coming back on the air tonight. I mean, we're looking for all this stuff all the time, right? As I think a lot of people are when they're trying to fill out their, uh, their social media sort of content calendars. And quick tangent, like why isn't there, and maybe there is and I'm unaware of it, uh, like a resource where all of this stuff like exists in one place, right? I want all of those days, the, like the TV premieres, the, the movie releases, the, the album drops, the festivals. I want to know, like, when is LeBron James going to be a free agent? When's the Big Lebowski movie anniversary? All that stuff in one spot. I feel like if someone created that and sold it to agencies, 20 bucks a month. You know, that's just throwing that out there. That should, should be a thing. But um, we were the next one. So... This is sort of how I, you know, we, I think, feel every day, like as we're looking through all of these, uh, these tweet deck columns, right, these subreddits, these different bookmarks and tabs about what's going on in pop culture today, tomorrow, the next week, and trying to sort of sift through it and choose which one here might be right for our brand to, uh, to react to. And it can be a little confusing, right, So sort of playing these scenarios through your head, right? Like, okay, well, if it's gonna take the client few hours to respond to it, and haagen might tweet about it first, or, uh, you know, the social media trolls might come out ab about this one with eye roll emojis, et cetera. Is it, is it, worth, is it worth pitching, right? So um, th th this is sort of, uh, you know, how we think about it every day, but I wanted to share a couple examples of ones we did decide to, uh, to, to react to. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Awesome. So um, last uh, NBA season, um, there was a big day in, uh, in Cleveland, right? The, the day that the Cleveland Cavaliers were getting their championship rings uh, was also game one of the, the World Series in Cleveland. And uh, LeBron was having just a standard press conference as he does each and every day, right? And uh, he, he just sort of had a throwaway line. A reporter said, what could make this day even better for the city of Cleveland? And he said, the only thing that might make it better would be an ice cream truck between the Q and uh, Progressive Field, the Q being the, the Cavaliers Arena. Get on it, right? So I showed those uh, pictures of our uh, tweet deck columns. And it was just any other Friday morning, right? And we see that come up. It's not really trending. Um, it was just, again, sort of a throwaway line, but uh, we talked about it, and um, again, going back to, I think the, the meme is what confused Math Lady, right? It's sort of like, is this right for our brand to react to, right? And I think it's always uh, sort of important to have the sort of criteria in place for um, get what gives you sort of the right to, to react to something. And for us, uh, Blue Bunny is a, is a brand that is all about instigating fun, right? Adding a little fun wherever they go. Uh, and likewise, um, they're not as big on the coasts, like in, in Cali and New York, right? But the distribution in sort of middle America is really high and important for them. So you add those factors and a few other on our list of criteria, right? We felt that, okay, this is something, let's react to. Let's actually take this guy, Alex Hooper, up on that challenge to, to get on it. Let's bring uh, not just any ice cream truck, but the biggest frickin' ice cream truck we can find uh, to Cleveland um, next week. And uh, I, I quickly, you know, I thought this was important because in my opinion, nine out of ten times, I'll take speed over perfection when it comes to this stuff, right? It's not always who does it the prettiest or the best, but who does it the fastest and the quickest and can sort of capture that relevance while it's at its peak, right? So, like I said, it happened on a Friday morning, right? And um, so 9.59, we flag it for the client along with the idea to find the biggest ice cream truck we can to bring to Cleveland. And uh, 11 minutes later, so th that's a big part of the equation in being able to do this stuff is having a client who has the mindset and sort of the, the preparation uh, to really be able to, to pounce on this stuff uh, when we flag it for them. So I even should have like, rewound this like to months earlier, right? It's, I always think it's important to have just sort of a, when you want to do this type of reactive work, to have that initial meeting with clients, just go through a few mock scenarios, right? Say that 
ex-celebrity or athlete or this thing goes trending about your brand, like what can we do, right? And just um, go through like who within your organization would need to be aware of this and uh, approve it, um, just so you are ready to go when it actually happens. So that initial sort of meeting with them paid dividends when it actually happened within 11 minutes they were on it uh, we quickly were looking at health codes in cleveland and parking regulations um, they found uh, a semi truck for us that they could reroute to cleveland um, and um, and this was part of it i think when it comes to this stuff like i said it's uh being first is uh, is often really important, right? But it's just about like who wants it the most, right? You have the, the d determination, right? And we thought, okay, like this, a lot of ice cream brands might see this, but it's Friday afternoon at this point when they're thinking about doing it. Are they, is haagen is Breyers really gonna hustle like on Saturday and Sunday to, to make this happen? I don't know, may, maybe not. So let's, let's, let's go for it. And uh, this is not reflective of, an average Olson Engage weekend by, by any means, but in this case we felt that sort of grinding over the weekend a little bit to make it happen um, was worthwhile. And um, finally Monday morning we uh, tweeted this out, right? So, hey Cleveland, King James asked for an ice cream truck to make tomorrow even more fun. Free ice cream is coming, see you soon. Um, and we, there was not, tomorrow was not actually misspelled. This was just for mock-up purposes, apologies for that. Um, <laughs> I assure you that was not actually misspelled. Um, and I think there's a couple things that are really important in the way that we wrote this tweet uh, that enabled us to, to get legal approval uh, to do it. Because some companies have a, you can't tag celebrities, especially when it's arguably the most famous person like on the planet uh, in a tweet. You just can't do that. That opens you up to too much risk, right? So in our sort of prep meetings, we said, we, we, we talked about scenarios when an athlete, a celebrity might mention uh, your brand. And if you just state what they said and you don't imply any false affiliation or endorsement, then you're usually in the clear, right? So we directed the tweet not at King James, not at LeBron, but at Cleveland. Say, so, hey, Cleveland, this is just what he said. You know, we're not, we didn't say, at King James, we think you'll love our newest bunny tracks, chocolatey caramel, peanut ice cream, or something like that, you know? Um, it was just stating a fact that would happen, so if his team sees us, it's like, okay, they're not implying that he is an endorser of the brand, right? We're just stating something that happened. So we posted that Monday morning. Um, quickly, just fans uh, of the team, uh, people in Cleveland, our own followers, were um, reacting to it um, in really awesome ways. That led pretty quickly to um, some local media coverage and local media uh, tweets in the Cleveland area. And then from there, it led to on a national scale really breaking through with the, the Sports Illustrated and the Yahoo Sports and the Bleacher Reports of the world. And then it's always awesome to, it feels like it goes from fan to local to national to meme, right? So it's like, <laughs> kind of fun that that moment when you realize you're getting free ice cream tonight and so whenever people just uh, will take your little social media stunt and put it in a gif and memes like this and shows up on reddit it's a it's a fun time right and this was before we even brought the ice cream truck to Cleveland the following day so the next day in Cleveland uh, we brought that semi truck, so not just an ice cream truck, right? Like I said, to really, to really stand out, we couldn't just give away, have one ice cream man handing out 100 ice cream cones, right? We wanted to do it on a big scale, so we had like 8,000 of these um, little miniature uh, bunny tracks uh, to hand out, right? So we brought that to Cleveland, um, got a street team, and um, you know, fans just loved it, and that night, uh, by surprise, we were uh, watching ESPN and um, saw this following clip um, on SportsCenter. This is SportsCenter from Los Angeles. Top players is LA style with a side of Connecticut. LeBron James was asked how Tuesday could be any better for, for the peeps in Cleveland. His response, ice cream for everyone. So Blue Bunny, while this was all happening, uh, had a big, gigantic truck outside and gave ice cream away all day long. 
So yeah, that was the top 10 plays of the day for on SportsCenter, right? And so when I think we're stating goals before we do any sort of project, we never, you know, would have the guts to put something like that. We want to be on SportsCenter tomorrow night, right? But that's just sort of shows the like sort of amazing impact, like when you, ca when you can sort of capture lightning in a bottle with these things, like how big that they can get. So it's pretty cool thinking like on Tuesday night we're watching that, like wow, just Friday morning, we were just looking through our tweet deck column for ice cream mentions uh, and happened to see something and fast forward a few days later, it's on national top 10 plays of the week. Um, so I just wanna share a few results uh, Darren Ravel, he's the, the sports business reporter for, for ESPN, he tweeted that the exposure the brand got was equal to almost $2 million. Uh, and I, so it was a fraction, point whatever, zero something is what it costs to, to actually hire that, that street team and to actually pay for the ice cream to bring to the city, right? So I, I mentioned earlier like nine out of 10 days, 49 out of 50 days, whatever it may be, there's not something like amazing to hop on, but that one time when it does hit, it sort of makes up for all of the other ones, and I think that sort of uh, definitely was true in this case with uh, that sort of return on investment, right? Um, and I think some clients that we, we talk to about doing this sort of thing, it's like, okay, but can you prove that drive sales, right? Like, we don't wanna just go viral or do social media stunts for, for stunts sake, right? So we um, we're worked hard to try to isolate uh, sales to the, the Cleveland area in the week after we did this and sales were up 18% in uh, the Cleveland area in addition to the 54% increase to the website, over 5,000 social media posts and um, a lot of earned media impressions. So that one was fun, and that was a, a reactive example. So I also wanted to show a proactive one, right? When you're looking at all these calendars, what's coming up in pop culture that's gonna be a big deal that everyone's talking about, and is there an opportunity for us to sort of pounce on it, right? And uh, attach it to our brand in, a, in an authentic way. So last summer, right, everyone will remember Game of Thrones came back, it was in July uh, for its, the first half of its last season, whatever it was. And we're, I'm sure so many brand teams were talking about how can we sort of attach our brand to this moment in an authentic way, right? Because everyone's talking about it. And it, it, we didn't really have an in, right? I mean, the, an ice cream brand that's like about fun and like, I don't know, dark murder, incest, all that sort of, you know, it's like, what, nah, it, it's a sort of a stretch, right? But here's the benefit of having these like multiple tabs open, right? And one, we're looking at the, uh, uh, what, what TV premieres are coming up and Game of Thrones is there. On the other one, we see that National Ice Cream Day is on the same day as, um, as the premiere. So then we're thinking, okay, HBO would love that, I think. Uh, but uh, w okay, th th now, now we have more of, a, of an internal brief to work with, if you will. How can we connect the dots from Game of Thrones to ice cream and hopefully no other competitors are thinking about the same sort of odd connection, right? So what we did is we decided to find as many ice cream cones as we possibly could. In this case, it was 2,700 ice cream cones, and uh, we made this. So, Shout out to our, uh, our friends at uh, Street Factory Media, freaking awesome builders of anything, right? So I would uh, suggest um, looking them up if you ever wanna build something kind of ridiculous, right? So we wanted it to be the exact specs of the actual Iron Throne, right? So it was seven foot two, made out of ice cream cones, like four feet wide, right? And um, I mean, we got some beautiful photography of it that made for some you know, funny sort of brand content. And so I think initially we were thinking, let's just like post a time lapse sort of like that on social media, maybe we give it away to a fan. But then in, in sort of talking with the clients, we're like, we gotta like bring this out into the world on National Ice Cream Day, on that premiere date. So we went to New York, 
uh, pretty close to the HBO offices, actually, and um, it, it was too bad it had to be indoors due to, due to rain, but we, we set it up uh, there in New York for, for people to pose with. Um, and so just sort of the, the flow of sort of results, how it came in, sort of just average people on the street came in to engage with it, right? Um, media locally then quickly like um, caught wind of it. So AOL and some other people came by to, you know, to cover it. Uh, we quickly start getting some, um, uh, some media attention and then we get some bigger hits sort of like, uh, this is uh, Refinery29. So here were just uh, some results for this one. Um, not as huge as the LeBron one, and I, I will say like the reactive one, the, the results for those are nine out of 10 times gonna be typically bigger than I think the proactive ones, just because I mean that's being in the moment like that everyone's talking about, right? Versus sort of trying to predict the future and all the nuances that come with it. But we're really proud still of these uh, results, the 5,000 people that sat on the game of cones uh, and sampled new products, 36,000 social media engagements, uh, some great uh, earned media coverage um, as well. So uh, going back lastly just to the uh, confused uh, math lady, right? If you kind of feel like this, sort of looking at the trending topics, is this something that's right for our brand or company? To, to react to, I would just encourage trying to get that criteria that I talked about uh, at the beginning in place, sort of like what are these five things that we have to answer yes to? Does it like, does it ladder up to our brand promise? Is it in a key market? Does it, you know, whatever. And if it says yes to all those things, you know you might have something to work with. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's what I've got. Thank you, thank you for the clicker help. I appreciate that. We have time for a question or two, if you want to raise your hand. Oh, of course, it's all the way over there. Here you go. Can you talk a little bit about how you guys established your street team and the brand ambassadors you used? Was that an in-place network, or did you have to generate that, like, that weekend? Yeah, so um, back on that timeline, it was like, within two hours after we flagged the opportunity for um, a client. And we, we have some um, local uh, partners here who have connections to, to, to street teams. Um, I actually think, it, I, I should know the, the company, might have even been Street Factory also um, for, for this example. But uh, we quickly said, look, we need like 20 people in Cleveland handing out ice cream for a couple hours on Tuesday night. Um, how quickly can you make it happen? What's it going to cost? And we sort of went back and forth on number of people and price, and and uh, you know came to a happy medium pretty quickly. Oh, look, right in front of everyone. Here you go. Thanks. Um, I was served one of the Blue Bunny Instagram stories ads this morning, so thank you. Good job. Oh, all right. Awesome. So it's already on my mind. Uh, I'm wondering, with the LeBron story, did you have a PR team, like alerting media? So in addition to the tweets, um, how did that work between your social team and the PR team? Yeah, so that's the, the beauty of um, sort of Olsen Engage, like I said, where the, the PR, social media, and experiential branch of our agency. So our social media folks and PR folks, a lot of whom are here in, uh, in the back here, um, sit right in the same space together. So we were able to collaborate seamlessly, like, hey, when's the tweet gonna be live? Should we throw some paid at it, targeting it at, like Cleveland-based media, right as the, the PR team was th thinking about who should we pitch first, what social media links should we embed in our pitch? So it was, uh, again, the, the value of PR and social media, in this case, like literally sitting right next to each other. And so it was a, uh, yeah, a perfect example of the importance of sort of that integration. Well, you guys can find George online or right here afterwards for more questions. Let's give him another round of applause. So our next case study, we, we have that, Greg. We can, we can plug you in. Our next case study is presented by Greg Swan, Director of Social, Digital, and PR Strategy at Fallon. Greg is a nationally recognized thought leader, brand strategist, and team leader who blends experience in emerging technology, earned engagement, and social media for Fortune 500 brands. It's a lot of blending, Greg. 
Uh, as head of social at Fallon, Greg leads a team devoted to building engagement strategies for brands rooted in consumer habits, creative technology, social networks, and the culture engine that knits them together. This is probably ah, the 78th yeah, time we've been on the SEC stage. And we love it every time. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to Greg Swan. How are you guys? Good. Hey, I'm Greg. I work at Fallon. We're a big global ad agency across the street or down the street. Uh, I lead digital social brand activation, uh, very similar to George. And uh, Fallon is a global big ass agency. We do really cool stuff. And in the last six months, we've done some really cool stuff for clients, including, now I've got COVID problems. There we go. We literally shredded taxes with Beyonce's guitarist while shredding on guitars for h and Block. We built a fanikin where you could text in anything you wanted and it would be shown during football games on the Big Ten Network. We relaunched Bud Light Lime Arita with a badass old lady gang who don't give a fuck. <laughs> we nominated Trevor Noah for President Trump's Most Dishonest Media Awards and just last week, how many of you guys saw this? We did April Fool's prank uh, with Arby's and Warby Parker, and it was super fun. So we are having a great time at Fallon, and I'm super excited right now to share the case study of how we brought together <laughs> Yep, there it is. There must be some sort of weird, like, ghost apparition or something blocking us here. Uh, to talk about how we uh, just launched Culligan's rebranding campaign specifically around the Golden Globes. So, uh, how many of you are familiar with Hey Culligan Man? Right? So let's watch it. Friends, in all your plans for modern living, be sure to include Culligan soft water. But how do I know if I need soft water? It's easy. For example, take the laundry. If you have hard water, it combines with soap and detergents to make hard water scum. So your clothes don't look so good, and they wear out faster. Do people wear out faster, too? Uh, you might put it that way. Soap film will make your hair look dull, and it doesn't do your complexion any good, either. I think I want a Culligan water softener. Of course you do, and you can buy it or rent it. So in planning for modern living, in addition to the electrician and the carpenter and the plumber, be sure to call your Culligan man. All right. Hey, Culligan man! Apparently very popular. All right, so those are the ads that we all kind of all grew up on, especially those of us in the Midwest. Culligan is actually a global company. And when they came to Fallon, they said, you know, our business is actually doing pretty well right now. But most of our customers are over age 30 or 40. And most millennials are very, very familiar with Brita and Pure water filters in their fridge. How many of you have ever owned one of those? Right? How many of you have ever owned a Culligan brand water pitcher in your fridge? Nice, okay, good, yeah, there you go. Um, and so we kind of dug in a little bit and said, you don't actually have two audiences, young and old people, you have people who are interested in health, and we call them the life quenchers. Uh, and it's really a lifestyle, not a demographic. Uh, so when we kind of break down into those, these are people who will pay a premium for a service. They're people who are more proactive about their health. They take vitamins, they might uh, take probiotics, they think about what they put in their mouth, and they also really like food. So they might like to go out to eat, they might like to cook, and uh, they care about what goes into their food. So when we think about how we're gonna talk about Culligan moving forward, um, we wanna move away from functional benefits of whole home water filtration systems and more into your lifestyle. What do you want? What, what motivates you? What do you care about? And there's this other thing that we found when we dug into the research and we did the focus groups and we got smart on this audience, and it's that, I don't know, when I, when I put my kid on a bike, I make sure there's a helmet. They have to wear a helmet, no matter what. Even if they're on a scooter, no matter what, they have to have a helmet. 
but if I jump on a bike, I might not wear a helmet. I should, but I'm gonna make sure my kids do. Um, I don't always take vitamins, I always make sure my kids take vitamins. And there's this semblance within this, this audience group, and I think it resonates with a lot of us, where what we do for, our, for others is often better than what we would do for ourselves. And that became the root as we started thinking about moving away from, hey, Culligan man, like, I'm a woman, please bring in the heavy salt into my house, like, please help me with the water, like, all this, like, we look at the, the legacy of those ads, and they worked really well, but in today's society, that idea of, like, here's the four men that will come to your house and help you fix things, that just doesn't work. And so we dropped man, and we, we kept the idea of, hey, Culligan, but we introduced a new line, you could give your people Culligan water, and we added the word water to the brand. So when it came time to launch that, and we have a big campaign going right now, we needed to think of through what could be a cultural breakthrough moment where we could drive cultural relevance for this brand among new audiences, specifically the life quenchers. And this is how we did it. Since 1958, consumers have heard, Hey, Culligan Man! in their local markets. Hey, Culligan Man! But in recent years, Culligan has become an old memory. Millennials starting to buy homes are entirely unaware of the Culligan brand or product offering. Yet water is central to so much of our home lives. Cooking, showering, brushing our teeth, cleaning our dishes, and yes, drinking. So, if you had the chance to give your loved ones the very best water possible, wouldn't you? That water is Culligan water. For the 2018 Golden Globes, Fallon architected a breakthrough cultural moment across TV, digital, and social engagement, engaged influencers, and even built an Alexa skill, all in an effort to launch the new brand campaign, You Could Give Your People Culligan Water. The cultural hook, the world's favorite cult movie, The Princess Bride. We got Dread Pirate Roberts himself to help introduce a new generation to Culligan with his famous line, As you wish. As You Wish is more than a famous movie quote. It conveys a timeless human truth that people will do anything for those they love. And now, that means providing Culligan water. We shot the actual storming of the castle. Dozens of extras and a Dad? Oh, yes? Can you make some noodles, please? As You Wish. More bubbles? As You Wish. Can I ice cubes, please? As you wish. Great food, soft clothes, and it tastes fantastic. Inconceivable. You could give your people Culligan water. Consumers loved interacting with Culligan water during the Globes. They love it! Generating more than 7,000 tweets and 3.3 million views on our social channels. Spreading buzz from Reddit to McSweeney's, Chicago Tribune to Bustle. In total, 100 million PR impressions ensured millions of people heard about the new Culligan Water campaign. We had Carrie Elwes engage with the brand in conversations online, and fans went wild. People showed off their tattoos, tried to give Culligan a golden glow, demanded we replay the commercial on the Super Bowl, and even asked to work for the Culligan Marketing Department. We also surprised fans with Princess Bride swag and gift cards to see the movie if they hadn't already. A breakthrough creative idea rooted in love. As you wish. Now that's how you launch your first national brand campaign in 50 years. Yay! It was awesome. It was so fun. So I want to share just a little background of like how all that came together. So from a social strategy perspective, we've got these overarching marketing pillars that drive the whole campaign, right? So own the home, reclaiming our leadership position, growing our audience. So for this, we, we really were just looking for the cultural breakthrough hook. And I can't share specific sales numbers, but I will say that we did see an increase in that, because I'm not allowed to share that today. From an engagement perspective, we wanted to focus on the Princess Bride conversation. How many of you are Princess Bride fans? Yes, how many of you have never seen the film ever? Yep. I love that. That is delicious tension that we played with. We know that there's, of course, a conversation around the Golden Globes, specifically Me Too, and what was happening on the carpet. And just general water conversation, the shape of water was up for seven Golden Globes. 
from a channel perspective, um, of course we've got like the TV commercial that of course is amazing. And Steph and Meg, our creative team who wrote that, were just fantastic. Carrie Elwes was so excited to jump in and do that. And he has a little girl. And that, those are real dad looks that he's giving her. And, uh, and he was totally up for, for doing, more, doing more on social. How can I engage? How can I help? How can I jump in? We use that content as a carrot on Facebook. Obviously, Twitter is the home of real time. And we also have the local dealer connection where all these local dealers around the country and Canada have their own social channels. So we armed them with content as well. What did we learn from this? Well, first of all, and this is, this is kind of the, you know, the special sauce, right, is like you don't just make TV commercials. You think through like what's a breakthrough cultural moment that you, can, um, that you can reach people in a way that they'd want to pay attention to your brand. Also, we borrowed equity from nostalgia. So for those of you who raised your hand, talking about Princess Bride, awesome. I personally hadn't seen it before we started this campaign. Again, I love that tension. So, and I kind of felt guilty about it, but also like I didn't see Star Wars until like a few years ago. And so it's like you make it to th age 30 and you missed out on culture and you just feel shitty. <laughs> but the truth is, Princess Bride is extremely cultural rel culturally relevant in 2018. It is, it is brought up all the time. And in fact, the social buzz around it is still extremely high. So we saw the 40th anniversary of the film in October. We saw it actually come drop, be dropped out of Netflix. That's this, um, Netflix dropped it. Um, and so we saw a huge spike in conversation then. Um, it's used in memes, there's social content, et cetera. So we borrowed equity from that um, around people who are specifically interested in movies and film and entertainment, which is the Golden Globes audience. Also, we don't really spend a lot of money in Twitter right now for most of our brands. But for this specific um, event, Twitter, from a real-time engagement perspective, is where we wanted to be. So Twitter isn't dead for the right, for the right uh, strategies. We also had a whole war room, and we took this as an opportunity to have all of our clients in, to have the media agency in, to have the PR firm in. Um, we had a creative team that was actually um, in Denver for another client, Skyped in and legal on the phone, so that we could engage in real time we also just had a really good time, um, just watching, watching the Globes and, and betting on who was going to win, et cetera. Lots and lots of preparation, right? And so you, you wanna get as many things as possible uh, approved by legal. And something that I learned coming from an independent agency to a SAG signature, a global agency, is that, um, as George mentioned, there's a lot of things that you just can and can't say and pretty much everything that we do has to go through legal. So I became best friends with our lawyer, uh, and she works remotely, and I just uh, got her cell phone number, and we have became best friends. <laughs> also, be nimble. So Carrie owed us so many tweets, and he was having so much fun, he, he calls, um, and he's like, Greg, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna do more. Well, what else can I do? And he's like, shit. Right? And so we start thinking, like, well, what else could he do? Where are we going? What, where's the conversation? How can we jump in, et cetera? Um, also leveraging emerging technology. So for those of you who know how every time I come here, I want to talk about the next big thing. Um, so of course, um, you know, within, within Alexa, we thought a lot about how could you use voice-activated home, home devices in your home around water? So specifically, we'll see if this, here's a, a little demo I recorded on my bubbles. desk. As you wish. Soft water makes bigger bubbles, and we can't find anyone who doesn't like bigger bubbles. See what else soft water can do for your home at heycolligan.com. Now, ask me about ice cubes. Yeah, Tell me about ice cubes. As you wish. With the Culligan Whole Home System, you not only enjoy cleaner water, but cleaner eyes. Two for cocktails, mocktails, and the occasional boo-boo. Now ask for the sound of water. Give me the sound of water. As you wish. So the top 10 uh, Alexa, one of the top 10 Alexa skills are like white noise. So we built a white noise generator with bubbles. So there's, basically it's an as you wish generator. You can ask it anything, it'll say as you wish, but there's only certain things that we've actually pre-recorded -re -pre legal things. Also took cut downs from the, the um, spots, put them into it, and now we're working on the back end. 
Um, so some really fun stuff to come um, from a utility perspective as well. What was really fun about that is that we now had another piece of, of content to talk about in our streams. And we saw, I'll tell you, we had way more engagement around the content that we had in Alexa skill than people using the skill. And that's okay, because we didn't, the skill didn't actually cost that much to develop. A couple of us did it over a weekend. Um, and when we were like talking to reporters, they were like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And they had to include it, um, even though um, you know, it, was, it was more of a toy for our advertising campaign. Also, we learned and knew, we knew one of the learnings coming from this is that there's also times to shut up and listen. So a big focus of the Golden Globes this year was around the Me Too movement. And how many of you saw this Oprah speech, whether live or later? So powerful. And that is not a time for a brand to be like, cool, what can I say? Oh, did she mention water? Like, let's jump in. Like, no, sometimes you just gotta shut the fuck up. Um, we did not build in user-generated contests. Um, instead, we use th things like Twitter conversation cards to bait people and engage people into commenting. So the conversation card we use specifically is, what's your favorite line from the movie? Tweet your favorite line using as you wish. Haven't seen it, confess with inconceivable. And again, this is rooted in the social insight we saw of all the people who said, I've actually never seen it, I can't believe it. I'm 35, I've never seen it before. So people would share their favorite line while, while resharing our content with their friends, or they would say, I've never heard of it, or I wish I had seen it before, and we pre-bought a ton of gift cards so that we could go back to that person and say, awesome, we would like to give you the movie. It was fantastic. So much fun engagement around that. So this isn't a Princess Bride thing. This is the, the rebrand of Culligan Water. And so this was really the launch moment in January for our whole campaign, which is running. We have a number of other pieces of campaign element. We have a big digital and social campaign that's rolling right now and a, a new um, element coming in the next quarter. So it's a really a launch pad for the brand. And lastly, like, don't forget to have fun. <laughs> right? So like, this, we, we had fun. We brought everyone in a room. We had a great time. We celebrated together. And the winner was water. Thanks. I'm ready to sprint. Questions for Greg? They're stupefied. All right, so you actually built an Alexa app. How long did that take? And then also, what do I have to do to tell my Alexa to tell me as you wish? So if you say, Alexa, enable Culligan's, Culligan water skill. If you say, Alexa, enable Culligan water skill, it will enable on your phone. Um, there's actually a really um, straightforward software development kit, SDK, for building Alexa apps. So find your closest nerdy friend and ask them to <laughs> dig into that. Um, but we really built it over a weekend. And um, my daughter is um, seven and in speech therapy. And we used her as the um, kind of bar that we wanted to hit for recognition and what you would ask and that sort of thing. We also went through and, and thought about like, um, very few people are actually highly educated around how to use these skills, and so we had all these things we wanted you to interact with, but maybe you wouldn't know how. So wrote it in a way that, wrote, basically scripted it out in a way that it prompts you to go to the next thing. So it would actually lead you through the entire experience versus having you have to know all the things you would have to ask. Awesome, thanks. All right, thank you, Greg. Take a second here for the changeover. Oh, I missed the mic position. He was a little lower. That's good. Good time to stretch your legs. Grab a bagel.
better this morning. Design, people, um, prop design, 
Um, and we ended up with 40 minutes of content across seven episodes um, and eight additional videos between that um, kind of like ad spot, that 30 second spot that we just watched, um, additional behind the scenes content, 60 second cut downs of that trailer. So we had a lot of content to work with for this campaign. Yeah, one of the things is we always knew social media So that's really when we took the challenge of how do we make this content and this truly high quality content work for us as a brand in that space. Um, so we launched across a variety of things. We had broadcast during the Oscars, we had during the digital media running, experiential, um, Times Square billboards. Uh, but what we're going to talk about today is your social piece, but it's good to know that there's a lot of context um, for how this campaign was launched beyond social. One piece of history, too, from the brand is we've only been around 15 years. And so this was the first national campaign we've ever done. Um, so it was really a statement for us um, to launch during the Oscars. Um, but then, you know, kind of how do we play around that? Um, we had a lot of media in core markets before, but never a national commercial or anything like that. Um, so we know attention spans are short. Um, so we didn't want to tease this for too long prior to the actual full robot and launch. Uh, so we only uh, had a tease phase of about three days. We launched on the Thursday before the Oscars with a 60 second spot running in social. So the 60 did not have that countertop thing that you saw. So it really just looked like a movie trailer. Um, and I would say it generated quite a bit of intrigue. There are a whole lot of questions. Is this a movie? Is this going to be coming out in theaters? Um, and then on Sunday, we launched at the Oscars with that 30 second spot and, and the countertop that we showed, kind of brought it all together and we've shifted for the past month. We've really been um, promoting the film and driving viewership of it before we shift into a brand campaign. But we're mainly gonna talk today about uh, the tease and the Oscars launch. Um, we had a couple things that we wanted to do. We wanted to reach an entertainment audience with these trailers, so we defined four different subsets of our audience. Um, so our broader audience, our demos, um, household incomes, all of that um, information that we always use when we're targeting on social, uh, we created a few different subsets that were going to be particularly interested in this type of content. So they also had entertainment interests, watched those types of TV shows or movies. One thing that did work in our favor was Game of Thrones was on a break and wasn't coming out for a while, so the people interested in that type of content, this that they're needing for a little bit for a new type of content um, to get their interest. Yeah. Um, so after reaching that entertainment um, audience, we wanted to make sure we had additional content to drive engagement with the film, um, and then retarget all of those people uh, who had viewed it to complete the film on the site or on our social channel. Um, so we teased the film in the, the days leading up to the Oscars primarily uh, with video and story ads. So we mainly ran on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, this is our, our Facebook ad we had running. Um, we had an Instagram story ad, and then knowing that Twitter was gonna be the big hub for the night of the Oscars and that real-time conversation, um, we don't normally spend a ton on Twitter, um, but as Greg said, there's a the right time. So uh, this was another case where Twitter made a whole lot of sense for the strategy. Um, then the night of the Oscars, we launched. We had a giant war room. Um, and what we mainly did that night to surround the Oscars logo was run that 30 second spot that everyone just watched um, across our social channels. So we had, um, we were running in feed on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram targeting people that were talking about the Oscars. Um, so we wanted to show up in conversation um, if you were scrolling through your feed um, or you had tweeted one of the terms associated with the Oscars, you probably saw um, that ad on the left, that 30 second spot. We also launched the full film as a playlist on Facebook that night um, so that you could uh, stay right in platform and watch it. One video doesn't make an entire campaign on social, so while we had that great 30 second spot and we really put a lot of our paid dollars behind promoting that the night of the Oscars, we wanted to make sure that we had additional content to drive engagement with the film and uh, 
help our audience kind of understand what this giant brand film was and what we were talking about. Um, so we repurposed a lot of content that had been created in support of the film into native social formats. One of the strategies that was really cool to see play out was on our Instagram account. So knowing our Instagram feed is a lot of designers, architects, um, and those are the type of people following us and how they would pair to this content. We use Instagram stories as a feature to run a lot of advertising rather than putting it in the feed. Um, but then we also set up a separate Instagram account for the movie and the film launch. That way you could follow that content in the Instagram platform if you wanted. Um, but we kind of kept our main Instagram account focused on the home and design. Uh, and you said that this is a Facebook Canvas app, so this is something that we retargeted. So if you had watched 10 seconds of any of our videos, uh, then you probably saw this Facebook Canvas ad um, retargeted to you. So it kind of uh, showed off the creatures and the character. A lot of the things that you could get on the site, we wanted to bring them in the feed in a really native, distributed way. Um, and Canvas was a great way for us to do that. And then last, we had a conversation card. Um, we tested a few different types of conversation cards. The one that worked the best was this um, creatures voting. So the question is, um, the creatures of Legend of Keeper are epic. Which one would you want on your side? Um, Kelpie, something you created. <laughs> uh, ask me later if you have questions. Uh, Rock Giant or Dragon? Uh, dragon one, not surprisingly. Uh, but the conversation card um, allowed people to kind of participate in the campaign in a more casual way. It's kind of a pretty epic and intense uh, visual. So uh, we wanted to give people an opportunity to kind of chime in on social in a way that felt a bit more native to how they would normally talk in their feeds. With our communities too, we, you know, targeting is so spectacular and social that we didn't see a huge detraction from our audiences because of this kind of audience, but then we built in new people to come because of the specific targeting we did. Um, we also launched on YouTube. So we, like I said, we distributed the uh, seven episodes across our social channels, and this really helped with community management because we were able to direct people to a variety of places and they could watch wherever worked best for them. Um, YouTube was great because people were able to watch it. Uh, we got a few comments that they will pull it up on their TV and watch it with their family, uh, all 40 minutes of content, and YouTube helped do that in a really seamless way. Um, so this is what social conversation and engagement looked like um, for the time period surrounding the Oscars. We took all the community management in-house. We normally have one person dedicated to managing our communities. During this campaign, we approved four staff. And so we really had to shift kind of the team and the mindset a little bit from answering everyday countertop questions to now questions about a movie and a film and taking that um, entertainment mindset. So we drafted a community management script um, that we had our leadership and even our CEO look at and approve to make sure we were on board with the strategy. Um, and then we saw the comments really spike on the night of the Oscars. But the interesting thing to us is it really held consistent throughout Facebook um, throughout the rest of the month. So typically we average 50 conversations a day and we were up to three to 400 on average throughout the month. So our team was pulling weekends and um, doing a great job managing those comments. One of the really interesting things for us to see was that we expected Twitter to spike. We spent a lot of money there. Twitter is a conversation platform for events like the Oscars. And while there was a spike the night of, um, it very quickly died off, but Facebook comments sustained. So people were very interested and wanted to know what was going on with the film right when we launched it um, and the days leading up to and the day of the Oscars. But that uh, interest uh, has sustained over time, and we've seen Facebook comments stay pretty consistently high. Um, like I mentioned, uh, people who had watched our content, so this is visual retargeting, um, on social or engaged with those posts um, were then retargeted with ads that were really more traffic driving to drive them to the site to finish the film. That was one thing we wanted to make sure that we didn't have the expectation that like the first time you see a piece of content you're going to drop what you're doing for 40 minutes and watch this full film. That was kind of an unrealistic expectation. So we wanted to make sure that we could stay in front of them um, and give them a chance at a later later time to dig in and actually watch the whole film. Thank you. Um, so with this much content, we had so many opportunities to learn, and we really wanted to take advantage of this. 
um, because it's not often that you launch a campaign with so many different formats and varieties of those formats uh, within a short time frame. Um, and we built a lot of tests into that campaign. Um, so this is just in the days leading up to and the day of the Oscars. We built in six different tests within our content. So we were testing um, audiences and optimizing on the fly once we thought we had stable results. Um, we tested the ending of the spot in social and people would jump out a countertop. Um, we tested a CTA, an explicit CTA in the copy, um, or just a link with no kind of directions. I think this is a really good learning moment too, and something that you guys can take back with you today is that you're not testing different pieces of content right now. A small tweak can really make a big difference. And so we optimized our paid spend based on the tweaks that we found learning, testing these different pieces of content. So Colin Farrell and mentioning him as the narrator helped her form not mentioning him. So then obviously we canceled that ad and put more spend towards the ad that was working. So that's something that you can do in your own world today as well. Yeah, we were fortunate we were spending enough in the days leading up to the Oscars that we did have stable results. So we were able to get a significant threshold of like uh, reach and engagement to feel confident in these optimizations. Um, but these were all optimizations that we made prior to like 3 p.m. on Sunday of the Oscars. So that when we were surrounding that Oscars conversation, we felt really confident that what we had out there was gonna resonate with our audience. Um, one test in particular that's a little interesting um, is that test with the end of the spot. So we tested two versions of the primary Oscar spot in social, and I think this was exciting for our team because you don't get that opportunity to broadcast um, to test like two different cuts of a spot and see immediate feedback on how they're performing. Uh, but we had that opportunity in social. Um, so we tested it. Um, one ending that you saw uh, that kind of pulled out to the countertop and very explicitly tied to the Cambria branding. Um, and then one without that really ended with a CTA to watch the full film and was not as connected to brand, did not include any product in it. Um, and we wanted to understand how these different endings would impact the conversation around the film and what type of engagements they were taking. It was fun from being on the brand side, because as the brander, I was thinking, well, we gotta tie it back to our product, we gotta show our product somehow. But in the social world, it's so different these days. Like the real key now looking back is getting a new audience to drive and then retargeting them as a part of the strategy about your product later on. And so this was really kind of Looking back, you're like, oh, that makes sense. But when you're in the moment and planning that campaign and being so close to the brand, you're like, why wouldn't you put a countertop in it? So it's kind of fun to look back as a learning. Yeah. So, thank you. Um, the people who didn't see the countertop review at the end, not surprising in hindsight, were twice as likely to click through the site and watch the episodes, likely because they felt like it was uh, actual film, original content, which it was, but uh, it didn't feel as tied to a brand. It didn't feel so much like an ad. Uh, so they were more likely to engage with that content. Ooh, we clicked at the same time. Um, and then of those people, one of the uh, really exciting learnings for us is that um, we feel good about our bounce rate generally um, as it relates to driving social traffic to the Cambria site. We had no idea how a campaign like this was gonna perform. People were gonna click through and be like, is this a, from a countertop company? I'm out. Um, we had uh, half the bounce rate of what we normally see. So a really low bounce rate. Um, over 70% of people were sticking around and they were sticking around for like four to seven minutes watching this content. It's a lot of time to spend with an ad. Um, so that was exciting. Um, how, did you, how did it perform? How did people react to this content? Um, we saw some mixed responses. So lots of positive interactions, lots of people love the film. Um, and then we had uh, people who were mad at us because they liked the film so much that they want to see it in theaters and they were mad that it was an ad from a countertop company, which is kind of like, and you watched 40 minutes of a movie from a countertop company and you loved it and you're mad because we made it. So we prepped everything from worst case scenario in the community management script to best case scenario and we found out that most of the comments were neutral or positive, which was a great thing for us. And as a community manager, you know, you're kind of like, yes, thank 
than this, not that much negative. Um, we did have, you know, a few negative ones. I think 10% of the conversations were negative, so we did have to um, deal with those. But a lot of times, too, we took the approach to answer about 30% of the incoming comments and then sit back and wait because this entertainment community was so engaged, they'd sometimes respond for us. And so that was really cool to see people have our backs with this piece of content. They're like, it's free, why are you complaining about it? <laughs> sit back and enjoy it. So um, that was really fun to see play out. Yeah, in terms of uh, popular comments, it was probably like, love this, this was awesome. I can't believe this is an ad. And then people chiming back in saying, are you really mad that it's an ad if you like the content who cares? Um, like Alyssa mentioned, we did a lot of prep for community management. Um, go to the next slide. Um, so one of the things we did was prepare a set of gifts to use in community management. So full 40 minutes of film, there's a lot of facial reactions. There's also no dialogue in this film. It's like a long form poem, it's all narration. Um, so very expressive performances by all of the actors, so we were able to pull some pretty awesome um, gifts together to use in social conversations. So we love this example. Um, this woman, Brooke, she, uh, she saw the TV ad uh, during the Oscars broadcast and was able to kind of connect it back to that tease phase, that 60 second kind of unbranded spot that we had been running. Uh, and we were able to respond with a really good connection line. Um, so gifts worked really well for us in community engagement. The other hero thing that we used in community engagement was the behind the scenes. And that's where our CEO really explains how this film connects to our brand. And so when a lot of people had questions like, you know, what is this, or I don't understand, we could respond with that film link, and then they could dive into that content and learn more. Yeah, so that was one of the great things about this campaign, being really in tune with the community conversation, and Alyssa and her team uh, were responding to so many comments that we were able to get a feel for how people were reacting. Um, initially, we had this behind-the-scenes video content. We were gonna post it on YouTube, we were gonna put a little bit of paid budget behind it one day, and as a result of those conversations, we kind of um, shifted this up in priority and prioritized it more than we had been planning on. Um, so one of the comments that we kind of take home from this whole campaign is if, is if you can make a movie this good, man, your countertops must be really good. <laughs> and that's kind of what we want people to think about. We try and do the best in everything we do, and the quality of the film really relates to the quality of our product. So as an underlying message, we had some people make the connection. It's not a relative. It's not someone who works for Cambria. So, <laughs> but this is a true comment. We saw, you know, 15 to 20 of these, and that's really a win for us. Um, what did we learn? Our two takeaways. Um, when adapting uh, content that wasn't designed for social to make it feel really native, explore a variety of formats. We had so much content and. Our social team who's here today was constantly sitting with, in the edit bay with our production team, um, with our creative team. Oh, I need a slightly different size for Instagram versus Instagram stories. So um, being nimble and creating a, a variety of formats really helped us um, to turn something that wasn't native for social into something that felt native. Um, thank you. Um, second key takeaway, take advantage of the opportunity to learn and build tests into your plan. So sometimes testing is something you do um, on the fly, but we built a lot of tests into the launch because we had just a few days to optimize. Um, so by planning for optimizations, we were able to um, get way better performance than we had expected. Um, and then the last one, uh, listen to what your audience is saying and react accordingly. This is kind of a no-brainer for social, but especially for something like this, kind of like a first of its kind, um, people were asking, is this a film, is this a TV show? And we're like, well, it's really like a long form visual poem. Um, so when you're watching something that's completely new, uh, make sure you're paying attention to how people are reacting and adjust accordingly. What's next? Uh, we mentioned the brand campaign. So after this launch and focusing on the film, we are shifting into a brand campaign. So we're taking all of these people that we've reached and that have engaged with the film. Um, we've captured a ton of retargeting tools, both on our site and on social with video viewers. 
Um, and we're now kind of launching a campaign that has a very similar look and feel and aesthetic, um, kind of talking about how our designs are inspired by nature. And if you have 40 minutes at some point this weekend, <laughs> Also, if you'd like to be sued by Colin Farrell's voice for your own home. That's it. focused on uh, 
brand awareness, but also kind of like we mentioned, standing out within that quartz countertop space. Um, so not necessarily consideration, but recognition of Cambria um, as a more premium brand in the core space. But awareness was the, the primary goal for this space, and now we're kind of shifting. Yeah, if you go into a dealer today, I mean, you can't really tell the difference without knowing the benefits of our brand versus other brands. But you know, this brand made a movie. We hope that's a little bit of an aha <laughs> cool factor that makes you want to buy our countertop. Yeah, we, we weren't able to share any of the numbers today, but we have seen a huge increase or brand lift in like search terms and direct traffic to the site. Um, and really this phase was about reaching the audience awareness on social and capturing these tools to retarget with the next phase of the campaign. And then as far as social listening, so internally we use Salesforce, Social Studio to listen um, to a lot of tools and then Space Limited, we do have a few tools as well that we really did a mashup um, to really hone in on kind of the sentiment and um, always on listening, but then sometimes even organic um, but knowing of all the ads running, you know, tracking that and having a tool to manage all those incoming conversations is really important. Yeah, we use Spreadfast Intelligence a lot for um, social listening and ad hoc events like this. Okay. I think we're all good. Thanks so much. Thank you. That's all our presenters today. Uh, save the date, May 25th is our next event and we'll have details and registration starting next week. So have a great day everybody.